Welcome to New Haven Baptist Church this evening. Good to see everyone out. Our Lord certainly did bless us with a beautiful, sunshiny day. I hope you got a good long video of it because I'm sure that we'll need to watch it on television again to prove that we can have one. Uh, but certainly it was a beautiful day and we had a beautiful message this morning. God certainly continued to bless us here at New Haven and he'll certainly continue to do so. Uh, one announcement is to make sure with ladies, uh, the last day to get registered, if you want to go to the Bethlehem uh, ministry experience on Saturday the 30th, will be the 20th this week. Uh, so if you're interested, the contacts are in the bulletin. Get up with them so you can get registered if you want to be at that ministry, facility, uh, ministry opportunity. Uh, remember each other in prayer this week. Remember the Jeffers family, uh, the loss of a loved one. And there's many others that we know that have lost loved ones. Uh, do we have anything special to mention this evening in prayer requests? Jean West. Let's remember Sister Claire. Let's remember Brother Herb. So let's play, pray for Brother Joe and Sister Wanda. I'll ask our ushers to come this evening to take the offering as we remember those prayer requests. I ask that you join me in prayer. Father, we're so thankful, so blessed, so gracious to know that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Master and Savior. Father, we're so thankful for that gift that you gave to us that came and walked this earth, uh, taught, a, taught 
taught and lived a perfect life and went to Calvary that we may have eternal life as he died on the cross and rose from the grave on that third day. Father, we look forward to the Easter season to remember what Jesus Christ did, that we can reach out and tell others about the love and the graciousness that he had to have a plan for salvation that we may have everlasting life. Now, Father, we mentioned prayer requests tonight to go along with the many on our prayer list. Father, we lift them up to you. Father, you know needs. You know the desires in our hearts as we mention them to you. Father, you know the he who needs healing hands and who needs a loving, compassionate hands around them. So, Father, we bring those petitions to you. And Father, we pray for one another here at New Haven that we may continue to study your word, want to learn to live more Christ-like, and to show others Jesus everywhere we go. And Father, we know that our many blessings have certainly come from thee. And we take time to give back to thee tonight from the many blessings you've given to us. We ask tonight that you bless this offering, that you use it, that you multiply it, that thy name might ring true here in this community. And Father, I ask that you bless the gift and the giver as it goes forth. For it's in thy name we pray. Amen.
let's all stand this evening. Turn around, let's welcome each other as we worship together. What a friend we have in Jesus, everyone. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to
despise forsake thee take it to the Lord in prayer in his arms he'll take and shield thee thou will find a soulless Amen. Hey, it's there for now, so let's go with it. Amen. <laughs> Uh, if you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn with the book of Titus, please. The book of Titus. For a little while, chapter number three. And I want us to look at some scriptures tonight. I want to talk to you about something real simple. Just, uh, just a message entitled, The Gospel Message. Uh, I think Sunday nights is real good sometimes just to get back to the basics and, <clears throat> and look over... Um, some scripture and just go over the basics because you got your really on Sunday night most of the time you have your uh, your core group I know that kind of ebbs and flows a little bit um, but sometimes we don't need great doctrinal truth we j or, or, or great theological debate we just need great doctrinal truths and um, and and I love to do that and I want to say thank you I had so many people give me so many different home remedies today some of them legal Scott County is a lot like Greene County in that sense. Some of them not so legal. Uh, I particularly like your different recipes with moonshine. <laughs> Didn't know there was so many. <laughs> but I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you for praying. Uh, my voice has gotten a little stronger as the days went on. So uh, I praise the Lord for that, much to the chagrin of some. Uh, but it seems to be strengthened up a little bit. Uh, Titus chapter number three, <clears throat> the first seven verses, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, Serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly, through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The gospel and the message of the gospel, we are inundated on a day-to-day -day basis, if you will, with messages uh, from the time we wake up and in the morning until we go to bed at night. Uh, the, the box that we watch a lot of, uh, it sends out messages about what we should drive, what we should eat, and what we should wear. Uh, commercials uses lizards to tell us what kind of insurance we should buy. Uh, car insurance, that is. Uh, used to, there was a message from a chihuahua to tell us to buy tacos. And a message from a bear to get us to buy fabric softener <laughs> and toilet paper. Government sends out messages to get us to accept their plans and goals for America. And the church sends out messages to try and reach people with the word of God. And the passage that we just read is a very important message that's been going out into the world for thousands of years. And this passage is about the message of the gospel. The message uh, that's in, the most important message uh, that the world has never heard, a lot in the world has never heard. Uh, and we talk about uh, messages. It's far more important than anything 
that Geico has to say or the government has to say or Taco Bell or the Snuggle Bear and all of that good stuff. Those are all ploys and messages, but that's the kind of message that will not change your life. The gospel message or the message of the gospel is a life-changing, life-altering message. Amen? And that's the message that we need to be discussing more than any other message. It is a message that must be heeded. If the message of the gospel is rejected, the person who rejects the message of the gospel will die and they will go to hell. That's not according to me, but according to God's word. That is a message that must be heeded. If the message of the gospel is received, then the person who believes the gospel will experience the forgiveness of sin and will receive eternal life. Say amen. Thank God uh, that it is a hear and be saved or reject and be lost message. I'm glad that it's a simple message. Amen. I'm glad it's a message that even dumb country boys can understand because that's the way that I've got in. It is an important message, the message of the gospel. And so I want to, I want to consider that for a little while tonight, this, this gospel message uh, that's revealed and that we hear about. Uh, the passage here points out some pretty important elements of the gospel message, uh, and, and I want to kind of give those to you if you're taking notes. The first thing I want you to understand and to see is it's a message of love. Uh, today, we've talked a lot about love. I'm glad that the gospel message, for God so what? Love the world. Amen? That's the message that God loved you and me enough that he sent his only begotten son, a spotless lamb, one who knew no sin, but who became sin. And, and I'm thankful for that. Why would God do that? For God so loved, uh, and as we look at this message, this gospel message, it's a message of love. Verse number three, we see the extent of this love, if you will. In chapter three, verse four, we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers, lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another. Wow. It's clear and vivid language. Paul reminds us what we were before we met the Lord. The Bible tells us that we were foolish. We were ignorant of everything to do with God. We were disobedient. That means rebellious toward any authority instituted by God. We were deceived. That means we were continually led deeper and deeper into sin by the enemy, serving diverse lusts and pleasures. We were a slave to our fleshly appetites and passions, living in malice, given over to a lifestyle of evil, envy, never satisfied with what we have, but always wanting more than hateful. Uh, that, that's a nature, uh, a natural fruit of all of that stuff above. If you're foolish, disobedient, deceived, if you're serving your lust and your pleasures, if you're living in malice, then one thing you will, or, or envy, you will be hateful. That's the kind of life makes us mean-spirited and hard to get along with. Amen. Uh, so we shouldn't be surprised when people who has a, have not experienced the message of the gospel and come face to face with the conviction of the Holy Ghost when they're ugly and nasty and nasty and just downright hateful. Uh, the reason they're like that is because they, they haven't experienced the gospel and the message of the gospel and accepted it like we did, amen? I'm always, I don't know why I'm always shocked when ugly people are ugly because most of the time the reason they're ugly is they don't know Jesus, amen? It's kind of hard to be hateful all the time if you know the Lord. Matter of fact, it's almost impossible to be hateful all the time. So it's a message of love. Paul's saying, you were all of this. And then he, the last thing he says, hating one another. Wow. Walking without love for our fellow man. See, this is what we were and what maybe somebody, some of us still are. And the Bible reminds us repeatedly that we're fallen, we're ruined, and we are spiritually bankrupt people in our natural condition. We are worthy of nothing but judgment, wrath, and condemnation. But 
While we were dead in our trespasses and sin, Christ died for us, even in our fallen condition. Look at me, church. Christ loved us. Isn't that something? Think about when you've been at your ugliest. Think about when you have been at your absolute worst. I think about that sometimes. And I think, man, even when I was that, even when I was there, <clears throat> Christ died for me. God still loved me. God knew everything that I was and everything that I would be, and he still sent his son. Isn't that something? <laughs> that's love, church. That's, that's God's love. This, this, this message of the gospel, it is a message of love. Even in our, God still loves us. He could have left us in our sins. And he could have allowed us to go to hell. But he loved us in spite of our condition. Wow. That is, that is the extent of his love. What, can, what can, can keep us from the love of God? Nothing. Nothing can keep us from God's love. So we see the extent of his love. And then verse 4, we see the evidence of his love. Verse 4 says, after that, but after that, that is, that is the evidence of, in other words, in spite of our spiritual condition, God chose to display his love for us. So how did he do that? Well, the answer to that, look at verse number 6. That's where it's at. Which he shed on us abundantly through who? Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. <laughs> Look at that. That's, that's, how, that's how God gave evidence of his love for fallen man, by sending his son. If you need evidence that God loves you, then you don't need to look any further than Calvary. Listen to me. If we get so smart and we get so, uh, so big <laughs> that we quit talking about Calvary, we've got a real problem. If we get so theologically focused that it's any bigger or any better than Calvary, I don't want to be here, amen? Because God's evidenced love toward me need only to go to Calvary. That's it. I, listen, I know the extent, and I know the evidence of this love. You, you don't need a feeling. You just need to look at the cross. You need to look to Jesus, and you need to see Jesus as he dies for you and for me on the cross of Calvary. And that will let you know that you're special to the Lord and that he loves you and, and is the reason that Christ's death, that awful death, the cross says, I love you. I like to look, and I didn't give this to the guys back there, but Isaiah 53, verses 4, 5, and 6. Uh, it really gives us the message of the cross, and if you read that, <clears throat> because here's what it says. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Isn't that good? Surely he has. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we're healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, yet it pleased the Lord. Look at this. And yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Think about that. God, it pleased the, you know what that meant? I mean, God was willing and graciously gave his son that you and I could have eternal life. Listen, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. We are the friends of God. We are the friends of Christ Jesus. And listen to me. We don't have a better friend than Jesus. Give me an amen. We don't have a better friend than Jesus. No matter what time of night or day or whatever. Listen, he is a friend that's closer than a brother. In my loneliness, all I have to do is go to him. <laughs> Why? Because he's a friend. How do I know that? It's evidenced by his, his death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. 
and what he's doing right now. What a friend. I love that song. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend. He, I, I'm glad when I, when I get to pooch mouth and feel like nobody loves old James. All I, that happened preacher pretty often when I'm getting picked on by deacons and stuff over what color tie I wear. I just sing, what a friend I have in Jesus. <laughs> oh, that's good. I told him you got to be careful picking on God's man. God has a way of making things happen, 20 points. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't even going to get into that. See what y'all did? You just encouraged me. That's right, sick them. <laughs> Amen. But we see the evidence of his love. And then verse 5, we see the explanation of his love. See, from our perspective, there is no explaining this kind of love. Why does God love lost sinners like he does? I can't explain it. Why does he save us from our sins? Why would holy God set his love on a sinner like me? Isn't that a humbling thing to think about? Why? Why would he give his son in my place? Why would he save me, cleanse me? Well, like this, why would he adopt me into his family? Wow. Can I tell you something as an adopted kid? Uh, and I know it means something to everybody to have family. And I don't want you to feel sorry for me, but I'm going to tell you something. The greatest thing that God ever done for me on this earth was give me something I never had growing up. He gave me a family. Amen. Some of you folks that have been adopted, you know what I'm talking about. Family's everything. I know it may be some of you that weren't adopted, but let me just tell you something. When I think about God the Father giving me a family. I'm talking about a, a spiritual family. Amen. We, we were getting ready for church tonight, and I told Addison, I, he, she said, whoa, whoa, Poppy, I came through the hall, and she said, why are you dressed up? And I said, I'm going to church. And she said, I don't want to go to church. <laughs> uh, and I said to her, and Lovey was standing, and I said, Addison, you're going to learn something about Poppy. My life is church because that's my family. Isn't that something? That God created all of us, put us in this building together, and we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And it ain't just this church, but other churches. We're a part of a big old family. Man, family means something. Why would he save me and cleanse me and adopt me into his family? Why would he do something of that nature? He does, not say, he does not save because we deserve it. He does not save because he sees something good in lost sinners. He does not save because he knows what great servants will become. The reason God saves sinners is found in the word. Verse number five, look at this. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his what? Mercy. <laughs> it's all about mercy, amen? Mercy, mercy, God's love and mercy. That's why God saved us, because he's merciful. And that's the explanation. It's the only, according to his mercy. Listen, God explains the reasons for saving. That word mercy speaks of kindness or goodwill toward the miserable and afflicted, joined with a desire to relieve them. Hmm. See, justice gives us what we deserve. If we receive justice, we'd all spend eternity in hell. But thank God he works in our lives according to grace and mercy. Because of his mercy, I don't get what I deserve. Amen. I'm thankful for that. <laughs> what a message of the gospel. God loves you. Christ died for you. And God will save you by his grace. The second thing, it's a message of life. It's a message of life. See, love is only a part of the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is a message of life. And I'm already told you Jesus died for our sins. And the other side of the gospel concerns how he, how he rose from the grave in 1 Corinthians. I don't believe I gave that to the guys back there. Chapter 15, if you'll find that, 1 Corinthians 15, and you write it down, verses 3 and 4. Here's what the word of God said. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. 
and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I'll quit preaching when my water run out. I still got almost half a bottle. Some of y'all are like, man, I'm, I want to go home and cook out. <clears throat> Listen, when we believe the gospel, the life of Christ is shared. The word of God tells us that a thief doesn't come but to steal and to kill and destroy. Jesus said, I came and I've come that they might have life. Listen to this. That they might have life more abundantly. See, it's not just about life. People who believe you can lose your salvation, they still have life, but they don't have abundant life. Can, can I get a witness right there? It's about abundant life. It's about living life like I'm going to live for all eternity. And then what the word of God said, I give unto them what? Eternal life. I have an abundant life because I believe that I'm saved eternally and I don't believe there's anything the devil and his minions can do to cause me to go to hell. It, listen, the message of the gospel is not just about love, but it's about life. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the what? And the life. Amen. He that believeth in me, though, what? He were dead, yet shall he live. Wow. And then he says this word. He says, believest thou this? That's like saying, huh. <laughs> He's like saying, in your face, Right? That's what that's saying. Believeth thou this? That's, that's a command. It's not Jesus asking a question, do you believe this? Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection and the life in your face. Amen. <laughs> that's what that's saying. And we have that, folk. Uh, and we ought to act like we've got that. Every person who comes to Jesus for salvation is given eternal life. They're given that eternal life. It begins at the very moment of their salvation. If you're saved, you have eternal life, and you have it right now. Hallelujah. The Word of God tells us, verse 5, that we're cleansed, that the phrase washing of regeneration refers to the cleansing that happens when we're saved. Some people view washing uh, as it talks about baptism, and that's not what it's talking about. They think our sins are washed away when we're baptized. That's not what the Bible teaches. We're not cleansed by baptism. It's an outward symbol of what the Lord did inwardly when he saved us. What did the Lord do? Listen, when he saved us, he washed us in the blood of Calvary. Baptism has nothing to do with salvation. It just shows the world that we believe what happened inside of us. It's an outward expression of an inward possession. Our sins were forever washed away when we accepted Christ. It tells us how we are changed. When he comes in, he enters a dilapid, ruined, decrepit building. He enters a building, a life that had formerly been condemned to destruction. He comes in, he remodels the place, he throws out the trash, he cleans the place out, he renovates it completely, he literally starts over rebuilding us from the inside out and transforms us. That's why the Bible says we are new what? I'm a brand new creature, amen? I'm a brand new building. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new hallelujah isn't that good we ought to live like that every day shouldn't we listen to me the the message of the gospel is about love it's also about life let me give you the third one before i lose it all <clears throat> it's a message of liberty the gospel is about love praise god he loves us it's about life praise god he gives us eternal life but it's also about liberty uh, I've touched on the themes a little bit, but I want to talk about just a couple of things briefly in this fact that we've been rescued. When the gospel came, we were lost and headed to hell. We had no hope, had no one to care about us, but God in his grace, God in his mercy, God in his love, he reached into our life and he lifted us up. He rescued us. Now, here's the thing. Having been rescued, what is my role now? Huh? All of a sudden now I'm signed up. I'm a first responder. Amen. You know what my job's to do? My job's to help rescue. There are people who are perishing. How many believe that? You believe that? There's people in Scott County that are dying. They're perishing. They think they need more money so that they can have a better life. They think they, they, need, they need a bigger house or a better apartment, and that's going to solve everything. They think the car they have is not good enough, so if they just get a different car. And so, they, and listen, some of these people are getting all these different things, and they're still miserable. 
You know why? Because what they need is they need to be rescued. They need, they need to hear this gospel of regeneration. They need to hear that God loves them in their, while they're dead in the trust by sin. Christ still died for them. God knows all about them. He loves them. And they can fill their life with all this stuff. They could, go to, they could go to sleep tonight a pauper and wake up tomorrow a millionaire and still have a void that only God can fill. Isn't that something? And we need to be sharing that, folks. That, that is the message. Listen, it's a message of liberty. We've been rescued. We've been resurrected. Look at this. When the gospel came to us, we were dead and sins. But the grace of God brought deliverance from our sins. And it also brought everlasting life. He gave his life. He made us partakers of eternity. We've been delivered from spiritual death. And we've been given new life in Jesus. We have been resurrected. Everything we were dead to when we were lost, we've been made alive to in Christ Jesus. Listen, there was a time when this book was dead to me. I remember trying to read this book before I got saved, and it meant nothing. <clears throat> After I got saved, this thing became life. Amen? It became alive. And, and, and we need to be in this thing a lot. We need to be reading it. Why? Because it's alive, and life breeds what? Life. Huh. I didn't know I was dead until I read this. I didn't know that life could be abundant until I read this. I didn't know that I need to share my abundant life with others until I read this. Listen, we have been resurrected. Oh, here's another one. We've been regenerated. Hmm. When the gospel came to us, we were walking in sin and darkness. We were blind, we were deceived, and we were doomed. But God in grace reached into our hopeless lives and changed us forever. Man, I praise the Lord that I have a new life. I've been born again. I'm a new creature. Everything has changed. The gospel gives us new life. The gospel message is a message of hope. And it's a message of peace. And it's a message of love. It's a message of grace. It's a message of mercy. It is a message of a new beginning. It is a blessed message. It is the message of salvation. Listen to me. If we've, if we've experienced the message of the gospel, then we have one job to do. You know what that is? It's to share the message of the gospel. I preach this tonight for a reason. I want to challenge you this week to share this message. I don't care what other message you share. It's going to be a big week this week, man, uh, for folks who love sports, especially basketball. Another thing, uh, a beautiful week. Looks like we don't have any rain coming until Friday. Praise the Lord. Five days without rain. That's a miracle. So we're going to have a, going to have a good week. But while you're out sharing all these different messages with people, don't forget about the most important message, and that's the gospel message. I'm glad somebody shared it with me. And they made it so simple that I can understand it. We don't need to be too, uh, again, theologically uh, in depth with the message. All we got to do is let, say, listen, Jesus loves you. He died for you. He rose again. God loved you so much he sent his only son. Man, that's the message of the gospel. Father, we love you. We're thankful for your word. And I pray now, Father, that you would take this message you would sear it into our hearts and God that we would take this message this beautiful blessed message of the gospel and share it wherever we go uh, bless our people here God if there's one lost I pray they'd be saved Lord if there's a discouraged Christian would you encourage them if there's a prodigal son or daughter bring them home thank you for today thank you for the gospel message in Jesus name amen and amen you're at liberty to go